came up in the in the late '90s when you know friends were starting, you know, SaaS businesses or you know, and this is all dot com bubble times, and you know they were building all these you know fun, sexy businesses, and I was doing heavy equipment. Really found a niche there, found an opportunity to um, capitalize on what now we can kind of all recognize as reshoring and the re um, establishment of American energy. We'll do about. $500 million this year in, in revenue and got half a dozen or so locations spread around the country. But we're tracking towards a billion dollars in revenue. As, as believers, we need to get back to a, a Protestant work ethic. We need to get back to some of our convictions about the dignity of vocational callings and, um, and uh, I'm encouraged to see some resurgence of those conversations. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks. Good, good Thank to you. have you. Yeah, good to have you. Yeah. Uh, appreciate you guys uh, being here. Yeah. It's good to see the new office as well. Yeah. Is, you guys are stepping up. Yes, sir. Stepping Moving up. up in the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, it's good to be back in, in Dallas. I actually grew up near here, and so this is kind of a little bit of a homecoming. I figured. Mm -hmm. so boots. Oh, yeah, that's not yes. a lot of Pacific Northwest Washington folks come down with boots. Exactly. Like that. exactly. So, yeah. yeah. No, thanks for having me. Yeah. Be here. Great to have you here. So we, we talked to a lot of people on our podcast who are kind of prominently they build businesses they sure. invest yep uh yep i don't think you've i don't know if you've been on many podcasts before maybe this is your first one i've i try to be a little bit incognito a little under the radar so well, that's exactly yes. why yeah. i wanted to have you on because you <laughs> yeah like you've built an incredible business Thanks. yeah but a kind of a low profile sure uh, yeah, why don't you tell yeah. us about why you built well sure um so maddox industrial transformer is our primary uh primary business um so we're in that electrical infrastructure space electrical uh transformers are what uh what allow the movement of electrical energy uh across the grid so um real kind of base infrastructure stuff um it's a space that i've been in for 25 years now and um, although I have had that, that history, uh, I came up as a software engineer. And so I had a very um, kind of um, systems and processes, but kind of, you know, kind of a, a high tech um, uh, angle um, to it. And uh, yeah, I came up in the, in the late 90s when, you know, friends were starting, you know, SaaS businesses or, you know, and this is all dot com bubble times. And, you know, they were building all these, you know, fun, sexy businesses and, I was doing heavy equipment and mm -hmm. it was at the other end of the fun, sexy, fast moving kind of end of things. But really found a niche there, found an opportunity to um, capitalize on what now we can kind of all recognize as reshoring and the re um, establishment of American energy. And we're about 10 years into this uh, at Maddox. Um, and uh, uh, we're, uh, we're based in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, Batavia, Ohio, uh, Battleground, Washington, and Moscow, Idaho uh, have a, an office out there. So those are kind of our main operations with people spread across the country. But, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, uh, you know, powering American industry, keeping, uh, keeping, uh, keeping the lights on. That's the quick, the quick of what mm -hmm. we do. The quick and dirty. Yeah. yeah. But you're not a mall and pop yeah. shop. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, I think, you know, this kind of dovetails with some of the conversations we've had. And, uh, you know, I, I love to see the, the the work of of new founding and and just to see other christian entrepreneurs out there i think there's a bit of a realization and i've i've tried to speak into this this uh this moment to encourage believers to establish businesses that are beyond that cottage scale there's so much um uh so much good and rightful uh place on um on productive households um that um i feel like uh we we need to uh, expand that vision and, and hang on to uh, a restoration of, of rightful family emphasis, but not limit our economic engagement at family scale enterprises. And um, I, I grew up, I was one of seven kids in a big homeschooling family and grew up with you know, my dad's upholstery shop and, you know, very much the cottage industry kind of thing. And this is a big part of uh, the conservative Christian world is small, small business. Um, there's a lot to love about that. And there are, you know, were incredible lessons I learned just growing up at my dad's, uh, my dad's shop, but there's also real actual limitations to, to being small. Um, and 
I feel like um, we've we've kind of stopped uh, stopped maybe some of our business aspirations as Christians um, at that smaller scale for just lack of um, lack of understanding on how to transcend it. Maybe that's part of it. It's also kind of this. Um, this thought, I, I, you know, you, you see like M. M. and Burke talk about the families as the, you know, the small pl- platoons or the little platoons in some, you know, um, terms. And if we think of business as warfare, uh, and I realize that that analogy can be stretched, but, um, but uh, we've, we've kind of thought of those little platoons as really the only fighting formation. And I've really wanted to try and uh, try and encourage believers to have a vision for business that's beyond beyond that scale mm-hmm. and to to understand what it means to fight shoulder to shoulder with other believers or to you know to, to engage in those those battles um uh where you have an alignment of hundreds of, of christian households um and i think that's that's the real opportunity that's that's at least one strategy to engage in the negative world context that we're in Aaron Wren's done a lot of work on this. His mm-hmm. concepts of owned space um, uh, have been, you know, in- influential on my thinking. Uh, but as we think about how to economically engage in this negative world, we're going to need uh, to develop um, economic institutions. We're going to need to develop corporations uh, that that uh, reinforce reinforce our values and. You know, COVID was obviously a big, you know, a big sort for for all of us. But economically, it found a lot of a lot of folks moving out of um, out of jobs where they were in compromised positions. Uh, sometimes it, it's proactive. Sometimes you know, people just want to be somewhere where they're more aligned. Sometimes they're they're persecuted out of it. You know, if they're not gonna, you know, if they're not gonna. Take the vaccine or whatever. Sure, whatever the case is. So we, we you know, we hired a lot of people in those in those days. Um, but um, but I think uh, one of the things we got to do in in this uh, this day and age is is build bigger businesses. Before we get into all the the theory behind it, can yeah. you give us a sense, of, mostly for the people yeah. that listening to this? Yeah, sure. A sense of the scale of Maddox and well, sure, yeah, yeah. We're um, so we're we're just uh, we're in our ninth year now. We're about two hundred and fifty people. Um, we'll do about five hundred million dollars this year in in revenue, and got half a dozen or so locations spread around the country. So, um, you know, we're not big business by by most scale, but we're at the edge of that you know medium sized that small medium sized uh, business, and um, and we're tracking we're we're uh, we're pretty transparent with our numbers just because we're on mission together with our people and we want to you know we want to share what we're doing and we're uh, we're tracking towards a billion dollars in revenue by 2027. Uh, we have a business plan and a market um, thesis that that gives us gives us tailwinds to get there. Um, so um, I think this size business has an opportunity to influence and uh, and be a blessing to the communities that you're in that you just don't have on on a smaller scale. So we're we're feeling our way through it. We're learning learning lessons, but. Um, we want to come alongside the communities that we're in and, and, uh, and be a, a positive, uh, a positive member of the, the community. And, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a process of, of, of discovery. We're not the only ones out there, but, but this is businesses of this scale and larger are very much underrepresented in the conversation of Christian entrepreneurism today. Mm-hmm. It's it's so much it's almost synonymous when you think of Christian business to think mom and pop to think of uh, of one household scale. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, uh, yeah, there's a lot of focus on mom and pop real estate, sure, you know, yes. portfolios like these are all and these are yep. good like broad appeal type of uh, yeah. projects that everyone can dive into. Oh yeah, this is a completely different league in terms of like a five hundred million dollar business, sure. billion dollar business. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get started with, <laughs> sure. with Maddox? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, was it a conscious <laughs> choice? Were you just in that space? Yeah, no, it, it very much was a was was a conscious choice. And I, um, I, I, I say that that in terms of intent, but the Lord has just opened doors for us and blessed mm-hmm. us beyond uh, beyond uh, our expectation. I, um, as I mentioned, I've been in this space for twenty five years. Um, started out uh, software engineering, worked up uh, to. CIO and and then ultimately partner in uh, in a in another company in the industry. Um, when that group uh, sold out to private equity, 
gave me an opportunity to, to clean sheet and to to start this from the ground up. And um, one of the uh, a couple of the the uh, the uh, kind of market uh, agnostic principles that I had uh, bringing to the business were first and foremost to hire um, uh, to build the business people first and to really hire mm -hmm. on on uh, culture and character. And that's been huge. It's allow us to um, do more with less, you know, to have, um, a, a, you know, a ratio of revenue to, to headcount that's unparalleled, yes. uh, you know, amongst our competitors. We, 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 we kind of fight above our weight in, in, in terms of, uh, um, employee headcount. There's companies doing less revenue with, you know, twice as many people as we are. And that's a testament just to the, the strength of culture and the great people that we have. The other thing was, um, was, um, consistency and persistence of ownership. I've been on this private equity bandwagon and, you know, the company sells private equity and mm -hmm. every five to seven years sells to a new buyer. And, and that presents a certain kind of, uh, mindset in the way you do business mm -hmm. and the mindset in the way you, you invest in your people. Um, we're building this, we, we have built this for keeps. We have no intention to sell to private equity. And this is quite uncommon in, um, in the entrepreneurial space, particularly, you know, with businesses of this size and you build up to a certain EBITDA number and then you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're flipping it out. This it, is owned by you and your brother, right? Yeah, we, right. yeah, we own, own the thing entirely outright. And so that's, um, it, it's been our intention, um, from the start to have it, uh, have it privately. Privately held. When Aaron talks about, I'm sorry, Josh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so when you were CIO, you yeah. experienced kind of that private equity cycle. Yeah. You got to see that firsthand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, and there's, um, there's certainly a place for that, right? Um, it's, it's, but, but it's, it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of business environment. Um, I, I feel like when you're, um, you know, when you're in a, in a, uh, in a privately held business with, uh, you know, a persistent ownership, um, commitment, you, you invest in your people, um, in a way that even subconsciously, if you know, you know, I'm out of here in three years, right. it's a, it's a real oh, different, sure. different yeah. mindset. Yeah. Yeah. But the, uh, um, Aaron Wren's own space concept, the idea of, uh, the strategic advantage of, uh, of, of ownership of, you know, it, it, you know, he, talk, he talks about, it, I think mostly in a real estate context. Um, but if we talk about kind of owning the means of, of production, if we put it in those <laughs> and not to get, not to get Mark's side, then maybe that's not a train I want to go down. That's, uh, you know, got where I'm at and that's not my, uh, not my jam. But, uh, I think we do as believers, we have to, um, we have to, uh, to own things. And we've seen, you know, friends that have built incredible businesses and built strong cultures, but uh, for whatever reason had to or needed to or or at the time thought they wanted to sell the business. And it's a matter of time until the um, values and worldview of new ownership um, prevails. And there's still, you know, um, uh, and there's a spectrum of that, right? Some of it is kind of still bought into the corporate myth of neutrality. Most of it now is activists where, you know, it's, they're not content to be, you know, uh, uh you, know, you know, neutral, uh, they have, right. you know, a worldview and, and you're being indoctrinated with that. And, well, the, uh, it seems it's like basically being in the negative world, yeah. um, yeah. maybe in the positive world, maybe in the neutral world, you could get away with at least the illusion, at least yeah. the illusion, right? Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. But in the negative yeah. world, yeah, it's, uh, yep. everyone's playing for keeps. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone wants to own it. Yeah, if someone is going to own. It's not whether or which. Exactly. Uh, you know, that way. Uh -huh. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah. How, yeah. how do you think about taking on uh, funding early on? Sure. From like venture or you know selling partially to part of private equity along the yeah. route. You guys have you know. Yeah, I think those were you know. So I took on a uh, I took on a, a financial investor, just a private uh, individual, to to put together a couple million bucks for us to get get the company started. Um, there's a need for access to capital, um, particularly when we're talking about purposing to build larger businesses. Access to capital is is a concern. It is, is a problem. I think that's a question we need to answer as a you know, Christian business community. Um, but um, but I think 
you know, selling, uh, selling control, um, has been a non-negotiable for me. Um, so the, it, I'm willing to put that in the, in a category of pragmatic decisions though. So I'm not, mm-hmm. I, you know, if, if, you know, it's a partnership that comes together, if you come together with aligned equity, that's, you know, if you've got some, you know, folks who are aligned with, uh, you know, your, your principles or convictions, I think that can be, I think it could be a fair, fair way to, to do it. But yeah. we do need capital. Yeah. yeah. Nothing. nothing uh, and if only you found it existed. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. So what, yeah. a big part of the strategy and what's cool about you guys is uh, the, you, you you also choose your locations extremely carefully. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Based on a couple of principles. Yeah. No, about. you're exactly right. Um, from the very start, um, we have, um, we've wanted to build purposely around strong communities so the way you know as a as a investor myself as you know uh not just financially but in in, you know relationally i want to spend my life investing in building strong families churches and communities so that's that's what i'm about and the way that imprints on on maddox has been building next to uh in communities with strong church communities uh and that's not just been one one church but uh, in greenville south carolina we have um you know it's it's in contrast to the pacific northwest it's a church on every corner and so we've right. got you know a variety of of uh, good strong church communities in south carolina um then in uh in battleground washington um same same story uh moscow idaho batavia, uh, batavia ohio we we feel like the um the the recognition that it's it's uh, it's incredibly costly to build uh, build families and communities and we need economic drivers we need economic engines and the businesses need good people so the businesses that we're building need uh, need good people so it's very very symbiotic um, and we invest heavily in the communities that we're we're in and um, you know we want to help people build good lives and good good communities. So, uh, yeah, as we're looking, you know, looking to expand, that is, uh, that's key. I mean, we've looked at other places. Um, we've looked at other places. We bought a hundred acres of industrial land and then ended up, um, uh, backing out of that deal because we couldn't find a gravity of, of community to build right. around there. And so we're really, we're, uh, highly committed, uh, to, to building around strong communities. Right. Um, so, yeah, and that presents all kinds of challenges. Uh, it's not it's not without um, you know I, I talk about the advantages of it, but you know you're when you're doing that, um, you've got um, you know people working together that that may go to church together, or people across you know a, a real a you know a spectrum of uh, of convictions, or you know not going to the same churches, but but the denominations uh, or. Uh, whatever theological distinction yeah so you got you got all that and um this is uh one thing christians need to learn how to do better and we're you know we're we're learning learning the lessons as we do that it's uh yeah it's kind of you can kind of see the the uh yeah just the the body of christ at work and kind of how that works itself out but i I think as as believers we need to get back to a, a protestant work ethic we need to get back to some of our convictions about the dignity of vocational callings and um, and uh, I'm encouraged to see some resurgence of those conversations. Yeah, we find that I'm curious if you see something similar, but we find that business is a really good way to create like economic coalitions and alliances with folks that yeah. where you would that you would otherwise not necessarily like converge. Certainly yeah. across yeah. denominational lines, it's sure. easy. Yeah. You may not go to their church, but right. you can build an amazing business with somebody. Certainly. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. especially in the negative world, like it's a sort of wrapper that you can yes. put around relationships, a vehicle that you can take advantage of yep. to say, yeah, I'm partnering with this person. He and I may see the world in slightly different ways. Sure, yeah, yeah. But yeah. It, but business is the the, the arena, the right. whatever, the space that where we can really collaborate. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a great observation. I've probably not thought about that as much as I'd like to, but I think one of the you know one of the muscles we see that's kind of atrophied um, in many of our Christian communities is 
is that of co-belligerence. It's, mm-hmm. it, it's the ability to work with people to a shared end, even though we don't have everything in common. You know, we, we're, we're different people. We're different mm-hmm. culturally or theologically or, or, or whatever. We've got some, you know, we've got some at least shades of variation. The business context provides a great example of that. We're here um, to, uh, you know, to create, you know, shared economic value that uh, is shared with each of our households. Um, and, uh, we can work to that end and we can set aside some differences. And I think that can, um, be a culture building force because then that can transcend into other things. If it's some community, uh, project or just some, a, a cause that we, you know, we have in, in shared belief, we can lay aside differences and work together to this, uh, you know, to this end. So uh, we, we've seen some, yeah, there's, there's, there's some positive positive fruit of that. There's some ways that working together in business can teach us how to work together in our communities and that's a good relationship. Yeah. Well, I was just making the point that like Moscow, Idaho is a good example. You oh, brought sure. up Moscow yeah, yeah, yeah. of that flywheel mm-hmm. of sure. you have a big major employer come in yeah. and it's easier to see in a small town right. uh, context where yeah. they come in, you have more jobs for people, you right. pay them good salaries. Sure. That yeah, money yeah. then goes into the schools, the yeah. community systems. Yeah, it's like yeah. the patronage network that yeah. the people and talk about. You can see, yeah, you can see the real positive impact. And so, yeah, Moscow um, is a great example of, of, of that. Um, and, um, and, uh, and yet I think there's, there's some lessons learned, you know, we try and think of, it comes very much to my awareness that we need more businesses like that because you don't want to get in a situation where there's one or two or right. just a t- you know, right. a small number of right. businesses. So this is a big, you know, a big thing I'm, I, I'm interested right now is how do we encourage other, other businesses um, to build like this. And you mentioned, you know, I'm kind of, um, I, kind of under, under the radar. I, the, the impar- the, the impetus for me to start talking about a lot of this has just been the recognition of we need more of these kind mm-hmm. of businesses. Right. And it, it's not, you know, we're not really trying to toot our own horn. I mean, we feel like, you know, the Lord just blessed us beyond our expectations, but, um, we want to, be out there and be an encouragement to others mm-hmm. uh, building this these kind of businesses because you see some vulnerability in a community when you've got one major employer mm-hmm. or you know uh you, you know so so we try and we want to be um you know be a great encouragement to right building these kind of right. well i think yeah just like broadening that mentality of yeah. saying like you guys are aiming to be a billion dollar right yeah, manufacturing yeah. business yeah, yeah. Yeah. no one else i know is thinking sure. on that level so <laughs> yeah. even just yeah. having that as a goalpost <laughs> is helpful yeah um well it's a fun time to do it too because we've got some great i i think you know when i talk to other other christian entrepreneurs about the moment we're in we've got a time when um you know my end of the world the industrial space um it's a good time to be alive. I mean, there's a, a macro trend of reshoring. And so this, yes. you know, this started out, um, you know, Trump began, uh, you know, the, the tariffs that came in to, you know, there's a lot of policy that, um, that uh, you know, the Trump administration brought in. Uh, the Biden administration changed the rhetoric, but kept the, the policy to a, great, to a great extent. I mean, we're, uh, probably if we talked less about specific policies and more just about the the over the arch of uh of it all um there's there's a um a, a co- cross party cross ideological uh effort to reshore a lot of american engineering uh, american, american industry excuse me so so it's a good time um to be in that um it's also a time when um the workforce wants more alignment with um with leadership and you see this in in woke companies uh a lot of what they're doing uh is sometimes uh, stuff that they believe but it's also signaling to to a workforce that has those values and it's virtue signaling but it's also economically motivated they Mm -hmm. you know if you care about whatever the cause is they're you know um they're 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 raising the flag on um, they'll attract a certain segment of, uh, of the employment mm-hmm. market. And, um, we, you know, we, we've done that, um, done that pretty poorly as Christian entrepreneurs. We've held on to, uh, you know, a neutral or, or positive world back to, back to Aaron's frameworks. And, 
said, okay, well, as Christians, we're just going to create this, you know, this kind of neutral secular corporate um, corporate culture. I, I think that's uh, that, that's a that's a uh, in many respects a vain attempt and and missing an opportunity for for really talented folks who want to be shoulder to shoulder with people mm-hmm. who at least at some some level share their values. Yeah. So, I was going to ask, I don't remember what I was going to ask along yeah. those lines. You bet. Why do you think that, so Christians, you've talked about Christians holding on to the neutral, maybe sure. positive yeah. Form, yeah, yeah. framework. We don't live in that world anymore. Right. Um, why do you, do you think there's also something to be said about why, or why Christian businesses, if I think of a Christian business, yep. I don't necessarily think of a good business. Yeah, I don't sure. mean that in a bad way, like in a pejorative no. way. I just mean it like it yeah. tends to be not ambitious, not competent. Yeah. We we asked, uh, uh, just for context, we asked David Bonson this question recently on the podcast, like yeah. why, why is there why is Christian competence sort of lacking in business? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. curious what you have to say about that. Well, it's uh, first off, I think it's a uh, it's a humbling indictment, and it's I I, I don't find it untrue. You know, in in my my experience, I think of the same way, you know, I, I mean, we talked about the mom and pop thing. When you think about Christian businesses, um, you know, I, I kind of think mom and pop and then kind of mediocre. Um, those are uh, sadly the, you know, kind of the connotations that, um, that, that I think we have and not, not ungrounded. Why is that? Um, why is that? So I probably have less clarity on that than the clarity I have to how do we, how do we fix it? And I think that's, really understanding a doctor of vocation, really understanding our calling as, as believers to, um, to do good work, um, to glorify the Lord and all that we do. Um, and, um, and then to be expressly Christian in every square inch of our life. Um, and so, um, so, you know, how did, how did we get there? I think it's probably some kind of, um, over, um, over emphasis on a, on a dualistic kind of sacred, sacred, secular divide. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, probably, you know, here, you know, in the West and in, in America, particularly kind of leading into a, 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 a dispensational kind of, kind of eschatology is probably, uh, not helped our, sure. our, uh, our commitment to, to building things that last. Um, there's, um, there's, uh, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's something that, that believers, evangelicals particularly have, uh, have shied away from in terms of real rigorous engagement in, um, in, uh, in, uh, economic life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's real unfortunate because it's, uh, as part of what we try to talk, you know, in our messaging, just as we found in general, but it's yeah. that business, that investing, the building new companies, especially extremely competent, powerful mm-hmm. companies, is a great cultural level or lever, and a non-coercive oh, yeah. one at that. Like it allows yeah. you to really disrupt yep. status hierarchy, status quo, yep. power mm-hmm. structures, you name it. Sure. Yeah. And. Yeah, and these tools are available to everybody. They are. Mm-hmm. They are, and there's um, there's there's real um, doing. There's real opportunity in in doing good work. Um, you know, particularly if you if you get into the cri- critical infrastructure space like us. I mean, if you need electricity, you're kind of our customer, and so um, we're able. You know, we work with the the wokest of companies uh, buy from us, and it's. Um, uh it, it's it's a space where if you are excellent they need you and right. you have an opportunity to yeah. um to uh to serve and have uh you know have some some access and some inroads um mm-hmm. that you really wouldn't have otherwise right that is interesting so you obviously yeah. you sell to everyone but oh, you yeah. haven't yeah. found that you are you're very explicit in your culture but you haven't found yeah. people who are saying hey we're gonna go somewhere else you know we we haven't um we we really um we really haven't um and that's one of the advantages of um of our space if you're um if you're a christian coffee shop you might 
you know, somebody who doesn't agree with your worldview might go to the one next door. There's no moat, all right, in that sense. But. Very low, very low barrier, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is kind of a, uh, one of the ways I think we need to orient to, um, to, to economic life in the negative world is getting in some of these critical spaces. Um, you know, building your kind of niche um, uh, kind of consumer um, uh, kind of you know soft kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of kind of business um, is probably going to be less defensible than um, than Christians occupying you know key places in infrastructure or you know critical. Um, you know, other critical industry. So I, I think, you know, it's, there's there's certain parts of the economy that are going to be harder or easier for uh, uh, for believers to build in. And I think industry is particularly, uh, particularly uh, well suited towards uh, like manufacturing kind of hard tech yeah. industry. Hard yeah. tech. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. exactly. That kind of thing. Yeah. 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 You think that's partly because of the blue collar uh, aspect? Uh, and, and, and I'm gonna, yeah. way I'm connecting those thoughts in my mind is, you know, probably so. Generally, so blue yeah. collar folks, you're going to be more inclined to go to church, and they're going to be. So if you want, if you're building that space, and you, uh, you know, your margins are not going to be SaaS margins. And sure. You could build in Tennessee, or you could build in Ohio. Or you could, you yep. Know, yep. 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 Uh, I think um, you can build a kind of culture and the kind of company much faster with that kind of talent. I think they are. Um, I think they're they're spaces where retention is particularly valuable. Retention of talent. So. Um, that's uh, that's that's a big deal. Um, you, know, you mentioned you know this is you know very blue collar space, and so we are you know demographics work in our favor. If you know if you're you know raising raising a family, and um, you know these these are very very much compatible with with uh, yeah that worldview. Hmm. Yeah. So to play devil's advocate, yeah, kind of on the on the big business corporate side. So you I, bet. A lot of people yeah. would say like, "Oh, I'm going to build my niche business. Mm -hmm. I read Wendell Berry every day. Of course. Like I'm going to make a craft, like yeah. local business, coffee shop, yep. uh, small scale production, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. And there's just this real rich texture. You know the employees' names. It's like sure. five, great. Yeah. Um, and I think the fear is that when you scale up to a billion dollar business, yeah. you wipe all that off. You get this kind of facelessness like classic 90s corporation vibes sure. yes uh how do you live think? and die in the cubicle kind exactly. of exactly like right. gray, Gilbert land yeah, kind of thing gray yeah. scale yeah. felt cubicle walls sure. yeah, the yeah. whole deal how so, do you think about not doing that yeah with big business? <laughs> <Right>. exactly <laughs> let's not go there so i think the dichotomy is more um more apparent than it is real um i think we have this you know one end of the spectrum is mom and pop good Evil megacorp, bad, right? right. So th that's exactly. that's real. Um, that's the catechism. Yeah, and I, I think there's there's a lot less of a dichotomy there for for one. Um, then I think um, the um, I think the ability to you know have like in our model we we expect to have uh, five or six hundred employees at that that mm. uh, billion dollar revenue number um, and. That you know, spread across a couple, you know, a few communities, half a dozen communities across the country. Um, that's not actually so many people that you don't know the people in your community that work, you know, work right. for a company like ours. Um, right, because you're like Maddox Greenville or right. Maddox yeah, you kind of know if you got you know if you got 120 people or something. Mm -hmm. That's you actually really you know yeah. you, you know not everybody's your best friend, right? But you'll. You'll kind of know it's not nameless, faceless right. at that scale. Right. Um, you know, yeah, if you've got twenty thousand people, that's you know, mm, I don't know how to do that. But um, but for businesses of this kind of scale, um, I think I think you can do it. And our model is is uh, is so far so good. Um, the the other thing that um, that I think you can do. Is really offer people a quality of life that is is unmatched in the the kind of the craftsman Wendellberry kind of the romanticized um, view of um, self employment uh, really loses its sheen when you're grappling with the cost the economic realities of raising a family mm -hmm. i have nine kids so maybe my my economic costs are maybe <laughs> a little different than some um but um but uh we need kind of the combined economic power of working shoulder to shoulder with others mm -hmm. to really 
get us where we want to go to really provide the fuel to build the families and churches we want to build. Yeah, I, I love that. And uh, we saw, you know, we have mutual friends yeah. uh, with, in Moscow with and Andrew. Yeah, sure. Everybody should listen to that episode. But yeah, one of the cool things yeah. that happened there with, with that business when it was at its heyday was, uh, you know, mostly a Christian company. Yeah. Um, anyone could work there, but it was yeah. sort of in spirit a Christian yeah. company. Like yeah. people would work there. That money would flow to yeah. uh, the whole community. Yeah. And because it's a small town, at the time it was like, I don't know, 25,000 people. Yeah. Uh, your kids likely, you know, your wives were hanging out together yeah. probably while all the guys were working together sure. or, or yeah, some yeah. combination mm-hmm. there. Yeah. And your kids probably all went to the same school or played sports together. And so yeah, yeah. the spheres of like social life, business, yeah. and then leisure and then yeah. ecclesiastical life. Sure. All like basically combined into a Venn diagram <laughs> that was actually a circle. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah, like yeah. that's so great. Yeah. It's kind of the dream. Like I can't. For people who've never experienced that, and, yeah. and it was a, uh, it's hard to do in a big city, but yeah. it is absolutely the dream in some mm-hmm. ways to, to have that kind of collapse of all the certain. Well, seriously. when you're doing life together in that kind of context, that's very much. I think that may even Josh be a better answer to to your your question about how do you, you know how does this avoid becoming you know the gray, nameless, just soul sucking corporate right. um, world is when you're really doing doing life together with people it's Mm -hmm. it's it's a very beautiful thing well and it sounds like you guys are very distributed too and so you have the different offices and you can maintain those individual cultures yeah without it becoming too big exactly location that's uh, that's also a big part of it and you know when when you do have um have life together in the level you've got overlaps like we talked about if it's you know some guys go to church together some guys you know, kids are in the same, you know, schools or do the homeschool co-op thing or, or whatever. Um, uh, it helps us learn how to really have real multifaceted relationships again. And that I think is one of the, the big hazards of that corporate life. You know, we can kind of make fun of it in a, you know, kind of, uh, you know, cubicle dwelling kind of um, caricature sense. The real problem with it, um, the real thing that I'm opposed to in that kind of life is the compartmentalization of life and where you have this, you know, one part of your existence that happens between mm-hmm. these hours in this space. Right. And then you have, you know, your church on Sundays and you got, you know, whatever you do on the weekends, you got your, uh, you know, a little bit of home life. I think, um, I think really uh, em- embracing a, uh, uh, a life with, uh, with overlap is, uh, is a big part of mm-hmm. what people find working for a Christian business. I think it's one of the things that uh, people increasingly, increasingly want. They, they understand the potential discomfort. You know, we are a for-profit business and, you know, I've, you know, had to fire the deacon in the local church. I mean, you run in real challenges, you know, you can right. find situations that, that kind of stretch your comfort zone. But these, these are good things. You know, how do we, how do we live as Christians, um, in all of the, all of the different stresses and situations mm-hmm. that business provides. Right. And, these are good things to struggle through. Right. Yeah. Good problems. And yeah. l- sure. Lord willing, yeah. those will be all the problems, yeah. <laughs> you know, like sure. long term. Yeah. Um, ideally, that is your problem set. It's well, just different groups of Christians. Yeah. And having yeah. like that structure actually allows you to, if you, if you do fire the guy sure. who happens to be a deacon, yeah. you actually, you know, yes, his job is disrupted. He needs to find some other sure. means of employment. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. his friends stay the same. Yeah. Yeah. His kids. Right. Still, that, that, yeah. The communal life, all the other spheres, unless yeah. he moves. Sure. Might actually stay on, sort of untouched. Whether, yeah. Whereas the large faceless co- corporation in a suburb, yeah. Like we're in a weird time of history where the large, you know, for most people, for the, a large group of people in the country, certainly across the world, but in yeah. the country, the largest institution that touches their lives is a faceless corporation. Yeah. Not a church. Not yeah. a. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so you, if you cut them off from that, that's their means of friends. Yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. colleagues. They would right. Call them. Right, right. That's their. Mm-hmm. It's 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 the reason they live in a particular city. Yeah, it's not a and, and anything else. And so if you cut that off, then yep. everything becomes one one more. Yeah. Whereas right. in a situation like that, a person loses their job, gets fired, whatever. Sure. Everything else 
can and should yeah, remain well, yeah. Yeah, it steady. It affects everything with that that transience built in where you can yep. just unplug from a job and then I'm going to go to a new city. Sure. And then the architecture, the buildings are all built around that mentality. So, yeah. you know, apartment complex. Yep. And so yep. in a place, in a location where everyone is planning to be there long term or where there's stability, you just, yep. it affects everything, every single part. It does. It's that it persistent creates, ownership thing. It is. It's right. back to that kind of persistence and it, it yeah. creates a, you know, a depth of community that uh you know so many of us uh uh desire and you know i i i didn't you know i, I had a, a growing up where we moved uh, we lived a number of different places in in my uh my growing up and it's really just sharpened the realization of the the need for roots and having deep roots in a community um so valuable to the way we raise our kids and uh and yeah that's a big big mm-hmm. part of what we uh we want to uh, want to encourage. So, in the vein of raising kids, this yeah. question for you: This is a problem that probably you will have that most <laughs> people will not have. But if you are successful in sure. building a billion-dollar business, sure. yeah, yeah. how do you think about passing on that wealth sure. to your children? Uh, because, yeah. like, people now that are successful, it's very popular for them to just give everything away. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, yeah. in the past, you have people. Your kid, kids turning into terrible monsters you know, yeah. when they get that payday. Right, right, right. Well, um, that's a a great set of questions that um, that uh, is kind of a privilege and an honor to be able to grapple with. Uh-huh. And that I, I just say that because as we as we find opportunity to work together as believers, as the Lord blesses that, as we create wealth, we have the opportunity to figure out. You know, we're going to be dead and gone. How do we pass that on to the next generation? Um, I think there's there's deeply interwoven with that question. It is just the the discipleship questions. How do you disciple your kids? How do you make sure that you're you're passing um, passing on? You're developing a, a love for the Lord and a commitment to to living all of life for for uh, for Christ's sake and um this is you know as my kids are young this this is where i'm trying to focus right now is those character formation things those basic fundamental discipleship things <laughs> then i think it becomes work ethic i think it becomes um it becomes uh developing a um understanding a deep understanding more than an intellectual assent but a a understanding of work as good and work as the calling of um, of uh, of life of of the you know the 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 work that is is stored up for us um, to do in this life and trying to trying to get our kids to to understand that is uh, I think are some of the fundamental things I think when we move away from from those higher level things and think about the practical things one of the things we have to recognize is the the context that we live in on a tax and regulatory standpoint is such that we have another heir in our estates or another partner in our businesses. And that's, you know, that's the, the tax system, uh, you know, 52% <laughs> of everything I have when I die, um, is slated to go to 52 taxes. Yeah. We've wow. got a, we've got a, in my state, we have a, uh, I think Texas is the same, an estate tax, a state, actually, I really don't know Texas's situation anymore. Um, but yeah, you've got a federal estate tax and then, uh, you know, and then state states usually have their hand out for that as well. So, um, so a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of thought needs to be put into how to, uh, how to mitigate those, uh, those risks. Huh. Good. That's a good question. Josh. Yeah, I, I well, don't that's... know. And I'll, uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah no, it's, yeah, that out. I've, I've not heard yeah. really any good answers to that question, but yeah. I really like your angle in terms of uh, raising faithful children and then yeah. whatever they have in life or whatever they receive in it, that's just going to accelerate them yeah. in whatever direction that you already kind of set for them. I think so. I, I think, um, you know, when we see, you see guys like, um, like uh, Warren Buffett uh, refer, you know, he plans on, I think maybe like Bill Gates, maybe giving a million dollars each right. to his kids or something like right. that, you know, the buy a home or whatever kind of, um, but not really having them inherit anything, um, um, you know, meaningful relative to their, right. their estates. So that's a very non-Christian way to look at things. And 
uh, actually Buffett kind of uh, uh, verbalizes that in in his kind of folksy way. He he talks about it as he just happened to win the right. ovarian lottery. Right. I don't know if you've heard him use yes. that term, but that's a real contrast to a Christian uh, kind of covenantal view of of God's uh, of God's providence. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we want to grapple with um, with the you know a Christian understanding of what it means to uh, to pass on uh, to pass on wealth. So those are all mm-hmm. yeah those are all big questions. Yeah, and I, ironically, Buffett has like sort of a zero sum mentality where he says, "Oh, I just I don't deserve all this money. Right, I right. kind of society gave it all to me, and now I need to give it like I need to redistribute sure. it back." Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, versus any any sort of mentality of building on that, or even giving your kids a shot to go beyond what you did. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I think those are. Um, it, it is interesting because he kind of casts that in a humble a way we we might be able to relate to as Christians on, uh, you know, on the humility and kind of the stewardship kind of aspect of it. it doesn't sound greedy on paper in a sense. It, on, on the surface, yes, yeah, on yeah. Sense. Um, but uh, yeah, I think. I think uh, bringing a Christian worldview to bear on those questions is something um, that Christian business owners um, uh, and, um, gosh, not just business owners, but I think if if the Lord blesses the work of our hands, we'll have we'll have significant material wealth to understand how to uh, need to understand how to pass that on to our kids or how to how to just be good stewards of that multi generationally, mm-hmm. um, right. and. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, we're hoping you know throughout um, the time at Maddox to to uh, uh, to create that problem for a number of people. There you go. See how they there uh, you go. how they could solve good it. problems. So, yeah. When you all were building Maddox, yeah. were were there any memorable inflection points in terms of either challenges or sure. growth spurts? Yeah. Um, again, like I think a lot of people can think in that small scale, but have a really hard time thinking about the path to growing beyond that. I think it's it's been a uh, uh, we've doubled the size of the business every twelve to eighteen months um, for nine years. Um, so it's it's been one big inflection point. Um, so that's uh, you know that's that's certainly uh, certainly been been a challenge. Um, buying you know buying out my initial uh, in, investor uh, in this, uh, I had a twenty something percent stake. Um, that we uh, we bought out, and that was um, that need for capital that we talked about uh, earlier. That um, that is um, is is paramount to find uh, capital if you don't have it yourself. That is aligned with what you want to build. Um, that's 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 really key. Um, that's that's really key, and. I was was fortunate in that sense to have been able to do that while um, maintaining um, equity majority and control of of the business. Um, but that uh, not everyone is so so fortunate in, in those those situations, and and it's it's a sad story when you you build something up and um, don't have enough uh, enough capital behind you to re- uh, retain retain control of it. So. Um, that probably uh, probably stands out. Also, just maintaining growth at this at this pace while maintaining um, cultural clarity is a constant mm-hmm. challenge, and that's that's less of an inflection point thing, just more of a constant challenge. Right. So yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah. I already used it earlier, but uh, you haven't used much this conversation is uh, risk mitigating risk. Mm. Uh, yeah. On the flip side, I think sure. a mutual friend of ours, yeah. C.R. Wiley, is writing yeah. about risk. Yeah. More Christians should should take risks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What What are your thoughts on risk? How does risk figure in your? Confidence? No, great concept. And and uh, and, and Wiley has really got his his finger on the pulse um, of of that that well. There's um, there's uh, there there's a need to to take a right amount of risk. Um, that uh, business itself uh, rewards, and so business is a good opportunity to kind of, I think, uh, learn that. Um, but as you know, as we think about building um, building Christian uh, businesses, 
I think um, I think we have to um, we have to get good at discerning um, the actual uh, risk and situations, and sometimes the safe route if it's just working for the uh, you know for the big stable company um, uh, may actually be more risky than aligning yourself with people who maybe you know maybe share your your view of life um and that's all that's about making making the right bets but um i uh you know i think some of the risks that that we have uh have taken at maddox have uh have certainly certainly paid off um i think that um that so often um we want certainty and we we hold certainty um in such such high priority that we're not willing to kind of be led by by principles instead of by um by certainty i guess if i can make a finer point on that i i know that working with people that i know and trust is going to work out better than uh taking some deal that you know that maybe I have greater economic, you know, I have greater clarity on the on the the economics or the technical data, um, but betting on good people is is a risk uh, that uh, that I always always bias toward. So I don't know. That's at least one thought in that vein. Yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. We need to at some point we need to have Chris on the show. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about his upcoming book. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So what's next for Maddox as you scale from? 500 yeah. million in revenue to yeah. a million. Um, yeah. What are you thinking of? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, we'll continue looking for good people, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a business that's, uh, that's driven by people. So that, that continues to be uh, a guiding principle. We're looking at um, another location. Um, we're not doing anything in the calendar year, but 2025, we intend to, um, to uh, be opening our next location. Um, that will probably be here in Texas. Um, and, um, that's, uh, those are some, some things kind of on the, um, on the, on the, you know, in the short, short term. Um, it, we, we also, um, have really benefited from the clarity of product and focus. We do transformers largely to the industrial, mar uh, market, the commercial industrial market. Um, we, we will continue, um, with, uh, with that clarity of purpose. Um, but we, you know, are looking at acquisition opportunities if it's within our supply chain or adjacent, uh, adjacent businesses. So, uh, I think there'll be the opportunities, um, opportunities there. I am very big on running focused business models. So I don't ever intend to grow, uh, Maddox and to do everything for everybody kind of, kind of play. I think, uh, I think you'll lose your way real, real quick on that. So. For the other businesses that that will own or invest in, we intend to run those as, as separate operating entities, and uh, um, that will um, that will likely be a part of the next uh, next chapter. Hmm. Is there a kind of business that you like that's that you're you're interested in investing in or building yeah. that's yeah. totally outside of the kind of industrial manufacturing something? Well, it's that might surprise people. <laughs> there's um, well, you know, there's there's some some smaller stuff. Uh, we we're uh, starting a, a bakery and uh, a cafe on the main street of our of our town. We do a lot of real estate stuff as well. So those kind of things. In terms of real operating entities, and I think I guess by the real, I, I think of you know if we're talking about you know nine figure businesses right. um, in in those kind of uh, those kind of scale. Um, I I love the in industrial stuff. I think there's a great kind of macro opportunity to really invest in American industry. So that's that's what where my my thoughts go business wise. Um, that's my my contrast of of real uh, businesses there kind of kind of betrays my my belief about the impact of even uh even just uh you know this bakery cafe that we're opening will employ you know a, a dozen people or so but there's there's an opportunity to to build culture and impact your community even at that scale so uh that's not lost on me so even as i you know talk about you know uh Christian corporations, you know, Christian businesses of a corporate scale, um, such great opportunities to just, uh, 
just be committed to your local yeah. community. Mm -hmm. so. Any lessons learned or advice for people building businesses, either small scale, coffee yeah. shop to big corp? You know, I think one of the things that, that I would probably, um, probably lean into is um, an encouragement to, uh, to prioritize being shoulder to shoulder with, with others on your same mission rather than um, falling into the trap of self-employment or small business or um, I, I feel like there's so much lost in um, see uh, young guys in particular uh, you know putting so much of, of their prime years their life their energy their blood sweat and tears into building little businesses that you know are are gonna employ uh, you know a, a half a dozen people or, or, or less and the lost opportunity to impact you know many many households you know dozens or hundreds or you know whatever you know kind of whatever the impact is I think yeah, I, I would really um, I would really encourage Christian entrepreneurs to uh, to think about what they can do to uh, to link arms with with others or go in the same direction rather than going it alone. I think that's a, an influence of American individualism that's done a, a disservice to Christian economic engagement. That's as good. you've uh, as you've been building the business, you mentioned, for example, picking up on Aaron Rents through sure. worlds of evangelicalism yeah. framework. Sure. Yeah. Are there any other frameworks or books that you picked up along the way that you're like, uh, you know, that's a that's always been a good heuristic. That's served me well. That's served me well. Any, any other ones come to mind? Um, you know, books, principles, or, you know. right? Right, exactly. Um, you know, I think um, I think um, reading uh, reading some about early industrialists. Um, these guys kind of went off off the rails in a number of number of respects, but. Um, but the audacity of some of these these guys to uh, take controlling positions in entire industries um, is is a is a real interesting um, uh, a real interesting thing. I think um, uh, I think if it's um, I think if it's you know the old um, uh, opportunities we had at the uh, you know the industrial revolution time. I think we've got some parallels um, in in this this reshoring time, and I think we just need to know how to use these times. Um, so I don't know. I don't have anything specific for you there, but uh, but these are interesting times that we're living in, and I think um, we've got a real a real moment to uh, to uh, to build some businesses that can make an impact. Awesome, Camden. Thanks so much, man. Thank this you. was a great conversation. Yeah. Good to have you. Great having Good you. Good to be here with you guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of the New Founding Podcast. New Founding has become a rallying point for founders and investors who are taking serious bets in the face of a stagnant business culture. Our venture fund backs founders building dynamic companies powered by American ideals and a positive national vision. These are the kinds of founders that embody the optimism and competence of the people who come on this podcast. If you're interested in investing in our fund, check out newfounding.com slash venture fund and follow the link to apply.